last time on Dragon Ball Z, after Videl's date with a Senzu, it was time for Son Gohan to enter the ring and test his medal against Red Shrek and find out just what it was about the mysterious man and his life partner that made such an impression on his father. Before the fun could begin, Red Man commanded that Gohan go Super Saiyan so he could assess his true abilities and test his usefulness in the battles to come. After some contemplation, Gohan begrudgingly obliged, but this was also when the skinhead heretics Yamo and Big Vidge sprung into action as well giving the unsuspecting teen a quick taste of prison culture via a shanky with a massive turkey baster, seemingly sapping the supercharged warrior of his essence before the two skedaddled into the air with a tank of Super Saiyan fluids off the Kami knows where. It was here where Kaioshin and Kabito agreed to get the heroes up to speed if they felt they had the nerve to follow along, because the thing they were about to come into contact with was no ordinary threat. Supreme Kai then began a lore dump that would make the intro cutscene to Elden Ring blush, informing them that he was here to ruin the day of an evil magician called Bobbity, whose father Bibbity he turned into a chalk outline some eons back. Bibbity and Bobbity's cursed family tree have a goal of resurrecting a primordial entity called Majin Buu, a pink force of chaotic energy on permanent black air force and do dirty timing, with a power level that would put even the so-called Super Saiyans of Earth to shame if he were allowed to catch a revive. So the mission is simple. Follow the follically challenged fighters Yamu and Spopovich back to Bobby's lair and smoke the whole camp before they can use the Super Saiyan Boy's energy to resurrect the Antichrist. I'm sure this whole thing will go exactly as the heroes planned, right? And the business. We call this foreshadowing. Quick shout out to today's sponsor, the homies over at HelloFresh. Look y'all, we all been there. You're just sitting there minding your own business watching DBZ when you caught that training montage of Vegeta doing push-ups in 150 times gravity and thought to yourself, man, look at the absolute state of me. I too wish I had washboard abs and a forehead for days. That's where the homies at HelloFresh come in. They are America's number one meal kit and can get you together with fresh ingredients and chef crafted recipes delivered directly to your door. And y'all already know I like to see y'all treat yourselves, so now you can pair your meal with free dessert for life and you get one free dessert item per box while you got an active subscription. The same body your dreams and your enemy's nightmare starts in the kitchen. So give HelloFresh a try and choose from over 30 calorie smart or protein smart options for the nutritious conscious saying who's looking to bulk up. And on those busy nights when your schedule is too packed with training, turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals including 20 minute recipes designed to minimize stress and maximize flavor and time spent enjoying your grub. So don't waste any more time while you're thinking Kakarot's just getting stronger. Click the link in the description and use my code and get 16 free meals plus free dessert for life while the subscription is active. Thanks again to the homies at HelloFresh. Now let's get back into the action. Returning to Kibito, in mid-flight with the high school pair of Moors, he speaks up to the two tag-alongs and tells them if there's any hope of them catching up with Papa Smurf and the rest, they need to pick up the pace expeditiously, because this leisurely stroll they were taking right now was not going to cut it. Videl speaks up and is like, hell you mean faster, my eyeballs are already halfway out of my socket now keeping up the pace we're going. Gohan looks over and proceeds to little body Videl, telling the youngin that she did well to keep up this far and he would be excited for her to see him cook, but from here on out the block is likely to be a little too high to continue, so she should return to his mom and the munchkins to catch them up to speed on the situation. Videl expresses her disappointment but agrees to turn back, realizing at this point her tomboy's charms would only serve as a potential life-threatening distraction, so she should do what's best and move to the supporting cast, not realizing she would be holding that seat for the rest of her Dragon Ball career at this point, but it is what it is. Before settling in a seatless purgatory though, Videl wanted to confirm one thing with her alien lover that he truly was a golden warrior and that it was actually him and his crew of incomprehensible homies that pushed Cell's wig back seven years ago. Slightly ashamed to admit it, Gohan finally fessed up, confirming what Videl Loki already knew deep in her biker shorts. She admits to Gohan that as much as she loves her pops, she really did think that it was weird that her pops, knee deep in a midlife crisis and more washed than Gohan's teddy bear undies, somehow went fist to beak with an extraterrestrial capable of shooting nukes out of his hands and took the dub. Videl demands that Gohan hurry off and he'd be the big dumb hero that he is and she will hold down the fort with the normies while he's away. And with that, Gohan and Kabito fly off at mock speed, leaving an astonished Videl waving by and under her breath committing to doing things to Gohan he couldn't even wish on the Dragon Balls if he makes it back in one piece. Gohan and Kabito rapidly made their way to the larger group, and in no time, the Z homies in the company of their new comrades, known as Yam and Vidge, beginning to slow down and look like they arrived at their destination. The crew peeped thing one and thing two, showing off the turkey base for someone whom Supreme Kai confirmed to be a jobber and not the droid they were looking for. And while all this was occurring, Gohan surveilled the landscape and in the manga was immediately made angry and uncomfortable by the berserk tier gore on display, where Bobby and company appeared to have quite a bit of fun literally ripping apart a family as they established their new home base. 
base. Kabito's pissed at Bobby's cunning, discussing how the damn son of a naked mole rat must have buried his ship underground to elude them because he knew they were coming for his hairy brown ass. Piccolo, having learned from the comedy of bad fumbles that was a cell saga, wants to waste no time and suggests they go flatline the whole lot of goons immediately as to not even risk the remote chance of the Hellspawn's resurrection. Unfortunately though, Kaioshin did not catch the fail compilation that was the previous arc and decided that instead the best move was to sit back and wait, believing that there's no way the baddies will risk destroying their ship by reborn and boo inside, so they still had time to assess the situation. After a few moments of silence, we finally see the stars of their show. A gigantic horned demon with a Tim Curry goatee and a floating creature resembling an old man's testicle with beady eyes whom the Kai confirms are Bobbity and Deborah. Kyle Sheen is shook when he sees Deborah, calculating the Steiner math and seeing their chances of survival drastic go down now that he was in the mix. He explains to the crew that while one of them likely very well could be the strongest in the universe, cut the beer is laughing as he accidentally steps on Goku's foot a little too hard and kills him, Deborah on the other hand is the strongest man in the demon world and is a force to be reckoned with. I know Goku was sitting there in confusion like, hold up Kai, back when I was like 11, didn't I box a dude named Shula who was supposed to be the king of the demon world too? They just be passing the title off to anybody nowadays. Vegeta looks on completely unimpressed though. You keep saying that if this boo asshole comes back, we're all cooked. But all I see is an overgrown imp with bad facial hair and an abomination that looks like my father-in-law's ball sack and this is what I'm supposed to be cowering over. I ought to kill everybody right here and now for even fantasizing I could lose to something like that. Goku looks over at the homie Krill and is like, appreciate you coming with the moral support, little bro, but your presence here is about as useful as some condoms you and 18 were using, so you should probably head back while the chance is still there. Krill looks over and is like, say less, I was just thinking the same thing. Appreciate the invite and have Gohan shoot me a text when it's wrapped up. Just as Krillin was planning his escape though, things began to go sideways with a quickness. The musty magician thanked Yamu and Spopovich for their services, informing them that the amount of energy they were able to juice out of the humans, the resurrection of the ultimate evil should soon be at hand. But just like your average employer in today's job market, once they got what they need out of you, you quickly become disposable. And with a glance, Bob D gives Spopovich the worst case of testicular torsion the world has ever seen. Had the homie expanding like a fist of the North Star villain before exploding in a spectacular showcase of blood and viscera as the Z-Fighters attempt to register just what the hell they walked into. Yamu saw this and immediately put in his 30 day notice, but it was too late. As Jobber homie with the popo lips came out of the trenches, aimed his blick and gave the poor man the worst bag shot of his life, exploding him into pieces from a good 90 yards away while the rest of the goons were back at ground level dapping each other up. After the funeral bells were done chiming for Yamu, Bobby and Deborah returned to business. Remarking on how they know that Kabito and Kai were up there hiding in the rocks with some pure concentrated bitch made behavior, but it looks like they brought some earthlings to stay and get cooked up as well. Deborah was happy to oblige, and after getting orders to smoke all but the strongest three and to keep Kai alive so he can go at him with a few hard piping brothers with flyers and a blowtorch, Bobby returned to the ship with Jobber McGee so the bull could get to work without interruption. And get the work this man did. As y'all are well aware, we have seen more than our fair share of disrespectful actions taken by both the Z Crew and the Rogues Gallery alike. But when I tell you that Kabito got done crazy, like I genuinely laughed at how unceremoniously they let this man get off like he was some random no name in West City when Cell touched down. The moment those little doors closed on Bobby's ship, Deborah was cruising like a madman making a beeline to the Z homies not so hidden location. And by the time the jig was up, Deborah and his goatee were already having their hands in Kabito's personal space talking about some what did five fingers say to the face. And before Kabito could even ask Deborah why his hands were wet, but he got the absolutely most crucial facial of his entire life. Like worse than what Supreme Kai be giving him on those Saturday evenings and just took the whole stream straight to the mouth. Ungodly work. But he got nuked so bad all the rest of them could do was say damn and admire the crater they were now gonna dub Mount Kabito after the magnificent work that man just carved out. But best believe DeBoer wasn't done. Tell me why this trifling ass demon then starts gargling from the back of his throat and hawks a loogie straight on Krillin's face and Piccolo's fit, just hell bent on retaining his place as the most disrespectful antagonist of all time. Little bro don't even know how lucky he is that that backwash turns people in the stone because if he would have gave Big Green a chance to register what happened, I swear to you they would have had the sense of the word he was about to catch from my Namekian brother. There are two things you do not do to black folk. One is talk about their family and the other spit on him. That man's been making ancestors were about to possess him with the righteous fury of a thousand plantations if Buddy had not had that magical spit popping off. He can't do anything but put some F's in the chat for poor Krill. 
but he knew a good 10 minutes ago that his human ass had absolutely no business rolling up to Majin Buu's house like he was about to collect rent. Then when he finally swallowed his pride and was about to walk away and live to smash cheeks another day, he gets spit on by demonic Tim Curry, leaving the poor dude bricked up in front of his homies for the rest of eternity. Then of course we get our walking Lord Dump Supreme Kai, who gives us a story behind the boy's magical saliva, giving these dudes the heads up hella late. Like, bro, be absolutely for real. This man did not give these fellas any types of heads up on what type of time DeBoer was on until the loogie had already left his mouth and it smacked Krill in the face. Then Buddy wants to talk about, oh yeah, by the way, watch out for his magical spit. It has magical properties and is OD dangerous. My bad. Krillin should have flipped this man the bird in his final moments as a testament to how assed out he left them unnecessarily. But anyway, Supreme Lord tells him that DeBoer's spit has the ability to leave any man it comes into contact with rock solid and the only way to get back to normal is to get things to a climax and finish the man off. After that, they should be able to get soft again. Kakarot then turns over to his blue companion and smiles gingerly, remarking that all they have to do is finish the dude off to get his buddy's rocks off. Say less. I thought it was going to be something difficult. As the board generic villain cackles his way back to the ship in order to bait the Z-Warriors, Vegeta comments how there has to be a less zesty way to describe this whole situation, but he'll allow it only because he was starting to get bored of the monologue and he's been itching to strangle somebody for months now and it looks like this is his best chance. As the Saiyan flies off, Kai finally remembers when he reviewed the tapes of the Cell Saga and decides that if he wants to avoid a solar system span and bag fumble, the best option would be to come with these goobers and make sure they don't do anything too outrageous and endanger the well-being of sentient life as they know it. And just like that, all the homies including the Supreme Plot Device arrived in Bobby's ship and played into his hands exactly as he had hoped. Bobby sensed this and couldn't help but laugh to himself at his galaxy brain plays and the absolute predictability of the numbskulls who are following him and supposed to be his opposition. If the resurrection of Majin Buu was in the hands of these smooth brains, then the day was as sure as his. Big Baby Bobbity then ordered his loyal jobber Pui Pui to clean up and gather their energy so the real show could get on the road. That's when this indisputable waste man Pui Pui hops in the escalator and rolls up on the Z crew, informing them that Big Papa Bobbity is on the bottom floor, but to be real, they shouldn't even be worried about that because he's about to toss their salad right here and now. We make a quick cut to Bobby and Tim in the control room, yucking it up, wondering how in the actual hell those shiny-headed jobbers managed to collect so much energy so fast for Boo's resurrection. When we get back to the Z homies, where Pui Pui is bug eyes staring absolutely astonished at the display in front of them. Bobby is now peeping the whole thing in his 480p crystal ball in disbelief that these cavemen are really sitting in front of him in the middle of his lair, Rochambeauing for who's going to be the one to push the wig back on one of his elite guards. And who of course would emerge victorious but the Prince of All Jonkin, grinning ear to ear that he finally gets a chance to show his best buddy Kakarot what he's been stewing in the crockpot all this time while he's been yucking up in the land of the non-living. None may have been more shocked than Kai, who couldn't believe the pair on these fellows that not only were they playing schoolyard games to see who a box of warriors decorated his kid muscle over there, but also they were playing a running bros pocket solo, when it would have made much more sense to give this man the mojito treatment and beat him silly while they had the numbers. Vegeta just about threw up in his mouth at the mere suggestion, asking Kai what the hell he thought this was. I don't know what type of fightless activities y'all be getting up to in the realm of the gods, but in this universe, we don't run gangs on free eats. The prince recommended that Kai just sit back while the adults were about to do their thing and observe how they get busy on Earth ever since the Saiyans dropped down on that worthless rock. And while Kai was reeling from the absolute insane levels of disrespect, Goku grabs the god's arm and is like, Look, little homie, I know you don't know what's like that, but Vegeta's actually spitting this time. Just watch what my little bro and his hairline got in store for this no-name who thinks he can box. Our perspective returns to Vegeta, who's like, Alright, bro, I'm done conversing with this fake-ass Freezer Force reject. We boxing or what? And this was all Pui Pui's ego could handle. In a flash, he was right in the prince's grill and threw a kick to his forehead aiming to give Buddy a second widow's peak for all the disrespect. As this man Vegeta, without breaking stance, grabs little bro's foot in midair and in one of the most unnecessary but sick things I've seen out of him, hits him with an absolutely nasty kick posed up to perfection. I mean just peep the form y'all, Buddy out here looking like a Nike logo. Wasn't a single damn reason he needed to do all that, but homie just wanted to make a statement and I applaud it. Just as Pui Pui was getting off the ground wondering if he met his deductible this month. Who else but the prince was just standing directly above him in the coldest onesie of all time. Kicks the taste out of the poor man's mouth and now he's got to worry about dental coverage too. Dental. 
Bobby and Deborah were peeping the whole thing from his little ass crystal ball CRT and they could not compute what they were seeing. Like this fella Pootie Tang was catching wreck like they had never seen before and suddenly Bobby started panicking yelling at Deborah like yo quick what's little bro's favorite place to box? I'm in tears bro really said no items final destination Fox only. Like changing the terrain where the ass beating occurs is really about to do something. Please, please, once he registered to change the scenery, got back with his bull immediately and started speaking spicy again. Aha, uh -huh, you in for it now, saying You might have got a cheap shot or 17 off on me when I was caught off guard in that little ass ship, but we on old block now, my guy. You ain't even gonna be able to move in my streets, let alone mess up my teeth again. This fellow Vegeta just smiles back, saying it completely still like, damn, maybe you right. This gravity might really be too much for a youngin. <laughs> Bro, when you got the Z homies in base form talking crazy to you like this, is, just pack your duffel and call it. I promise it's not worth it. If you can't even make them hit the generic, wipe them out, <laughs> guess it's time for me to get serious. Shonen Pro tagline, then you have no business being in here, little bro. Apparently, Pui Pui didn't read the handbook, though, and right as he was preparing to get his rocks off on the thoughts of the defenseless prince, this man Vegeta rolls up and gives him the craziest nipple twister of all time. Man just put his hands to his chest and said, clear, and in the next frame, Buddy was chopped into more pieces than Roshi's Viagra he'd be taking with his apple sauce in the morning. And here, with Supreme Kai shocking immensely underestimating his company, is where we'll call it. And it begins, homies. The A squad of the Z crew have finally made contact with Bobby's ship, and the games that will decide the fate of the solar system have begun. Tune in next time as the Z crew face more opponents and slowly make their descent into the bowels of Bobby's ship. Were the Z fighters' predictions about Supreme Kai overselling the threat correct, or are the terrors remaining to be seen upon Bobby's ship worthy of the gods' caution? Only one way to find out. Be easy, y'all. Thanks for coming, and I'll catch you again in the next video.